Hey, folks, Roland Martin here, broadcasting live from Los Angeles, coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered for Thursday, March 14th, 2019. A powerhouse group of black women leaders speak out on civil rights, voter suppression, social justice, and more at a news conference on Capitol Hill to kick off the Black Women's Round Tables Women of Power Summit. We'll have the details for you. Uh, former Texas Congressman Beto O'Rourke enters a race for president after weeks of media hype. But where's the breathless coverage for Stacey Abrams and Andrew Gillum? They also lost major races in 2018, but they all lost on the biggest margin. We will break that down with our panel. The Southern Poverty Law Center has fired co-founder Morris Dees, citing misconduct. They won't say what the misconduct was. This is a huge development coming down in the past hour. Also, Donald Trump let out encouraged his supporters to commit violence if they get to a certain point. Folks, this is dangerous. The words of a would-be dictator. Also, police officers take a black woman down to the ground after she called the cops on a white man threatening her with a gun. Wait till y'all see this shocking video. Also, black women die in childbirth at rates three to four times more than white women. We'll find out why and what can be done about it. And also, the home of Medgar and Murley Evers in Jackson, Mississippi, is now a national monument. But why is the governor, Republican governor of Mississippi, giving Republicans all the credit? Oh, I call BS on that. We'll also show you a video tour that I shot at the house when I was there in November. It is time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Let's go. Folks, uh, I am broadcasting live from Los Angeles. We're here, of course, to broadcast tomorrow the XQ America uh, education event taking place here in Los Angeles. And so we'll tell you more about that. Uh, but today in D.C., a who's who of powerful black women kicked off the Black Women's Roundtables Women of Power Summit at a news conference this morning on Capitol Hill. Our cameras were there. We live streamed the event. Here is some of what took place. We're determined to make sure that we save our democracy from peril. We're getting ready for 2020, and we're also getting ready for 2019 because there's elections every year, last I checked. We have communicated clearly to this country that every issue is a woman's issue. And that when it comes time to show up, to demonstrate where we stand on the issues, we will be there, we will pull that lever, but even before Pulling that lever, we will take our feet and put them on the concrete and walk and march and holler and talk on the phone and talk through social media to let everyone know that this is the time of accountability. And this accountability is to us. As a woman standing here, I want you all to just reflect on a moment that we just saw where a black woman was used as a prop. We are not a prop. We are the fiber of this country. When you start talking about issues that are important to America, black women rise to the top. Black women march with the white women to say in this country, we should have the right to vote. And that was only 100 years ago. We are fighting to close the wage gap. But when you talk about the wage gap, who has the biggest gap? Black women. When you talk about paid family leave, when you talk about common sense gun control, how many mothers and children have cried because we refuse to stand up and address that crisis? I want you to know 
that when we talk about poverty in America, I sit on appropriations. And if you want to know what someone believes and who they are, follow their money. This country has said that we do not want people in poverty and that we will allocate funds to eliminate poverty. I will tell you, the largest demographic of poverty in America are women with children. Women with children. Uh, we, we've got to talk about the mortality rate of African-American women and, and infant mortality and the criminalization of our girls in school and STEM education for our young girls. You know, all of the issues that uh, we have been fighting for for so many years, now is our time. Our time has come to make all of, to, to repair, first of all, the damage and then to move forward. I'd like to call upon the Black Women's Roundtable to join me in a major initiative of dealing with the plight of our children. They are impoverished. I know that that's been spoken of. Educational systems are being nickel and dime. Their support systems are only the state because when the family becomes dysfunctional, there is no other step in, there's no other diversion. They go into the state system and there are people who will witness to you what happens when I'm in the state system. Or the juvenile justice system of which you go into that system and there is no sentence and you're there for a decade. We the people have the power and our most powerful weapon, the people's house. Now is the time to be vigilant, to watch for efforts to change the rules. Now is the time to speak up when we see voter suppression. Now is the time to hold corrupt election officials accountable when they take action to harm voters. The most powerful thing that we can do is to make sure that our voices are heard on election day. Not just every four years and not just for federal office, but every year because there is no such thing as an off year. We need to show up and keep showing up every year for every ballot we can cast to vote at every level. City councils, school boards, DAs, state legislatures special elections, congressional seats, all of these are incredibly powerful opportunities to make sure we are electing officials who will represent us. All right, folks, let's break it down with our panel. Dr. Greg Carr, Chair of the Department of Afro-American Studies, Howard University, Long Victoria Burke, writer for NNPA, also Demetrius Minor, Coalition's Director, Americans for Prosperity. Demetrius, I'm going to start with you uh, because we're entering into the 2020 season. When you look at the numbers, when you look at uh, the reality, black women hate your party more than anybody else. Uh, and so uh, you actually think diamond and silk, or oh, as I call them, uh, Cuba zirconia and polyester, could somehow be the way to attract black women. The Republican Party has a serious problem talking to those women. Well, first of all, Roland, thank you for allowing me to come on your show. When I think of conservatism and when I think about um, policy, and a legislative policy, I can assure you that diamond and silk um, do not come to mind. My stance is simple as this. You go to the community and you talk about the issues, and then you trust a voter to make an informed decision for themselves. Here in the state of Florida, where I reside, in our previous governor's race, a large portion of black women voted for Governor Ron DeSantis. Why? Because school choice and education was very important to them. So this narrative that some people may have that black women or black men, for that matter, will vote a particular way, I think that's a very foolish position. You go out there, you talk about the issues, and then you'll find that more people are aligned with you than you may think. Um, Greg and Lauren, uh, first of all, uh, Demetrius is right. When you saw the exit polling data, uh, you did see that, which was a reverse from many other places where you had more black men versus black women who were voting, who voted in that governor's race. Up on the presidential race, again, I remember being in a meeting with uh, Rice Priebus at the Republican National Committee in 2016 and uh, Tara Wall, uh, a black female conservative, she said, look, no party hates us more than black women. Democrats also have an issue because after 2016, they saw a 10 point drop in terms of black women uh, supporting the Democratic Party. And so black women are going to be a huge voting block uh, that folks will be trying to go after in the 2020 campaign. Yeah, particularly since they decided, obviously, the senatorial race uh, in Alabama and, of course, have represented 
I think what the Democratic Party should be catering to. The Democratic Party does have a habit of catering to groups that are not for the Democratic Party and are very expensive votes to win. At some point, they are going to have to uh, go to the group that supports them the most and is the most loyal and shows up and actually cast a, a ballot, and that is black women. Yeah, I would agree. Um, started this week, uh, Monday, spent the day with uh, thousands of Deltas down at the Hilton here in, in, in uh, Washington with Delta Days on Capitol Hill. And of course, sitting on the dais there is Marsha Fudge, who's a past national president of Delta Seven Theta. Those sisters are weaponized in terms of their work. Uh, Andrew Gillum, who spoke at the luncheon, talked about the fact that black women are in the forefront. Sherrod Brown, that's stupid in Ohio, when he says black women are the heart of the Democratic Party. When we look at the 12 GOP senators, that vo voted against Trump with this uh, this uh, this security uh, the emergency declaration the other day. Look at Wicker in Mississippi. Look at Portman in Ohio. Look at Rubio in Florida. They can count. They were one short of having a veto-proof uh, uh, vote, but those are senators who are in states who know they can be knocked off with black women holding the knife to their throat. So let's be very clear. With Sister Melanie, who you've had in this space many times, and all of those sisters and brothers who were out there on, on the steps today are emphasizing is these demographics are never going back to the old politics, and uh, the GOP knows what time it is. Black women are awake. Uh, Demetrius, issues, issues, issues. And so uh, the question is... Uh, how does Donald Trump even talk to these black women when the reality is he makes no real effort to talk beyond uh, his rallies of largely white voters? I would agree with you that uh, there is, it's troubling to see the base, the initial base of, 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 of President <clears throat> Trump. Uh, however, I, I will point out his advantages. Simply, number one, he's an incumbent. Um, the incumbent president has the advantage of the bully pulpit, um, regardless of um, party affiliation. Number two, the Democrats' party's failure, at least at this point, to, to know what their identity is. Um, their, their stance is being far left um, in terms of abortion, infanticide, um, economic socialism. It's turning off independent voters and even voters within their own party. So I would agree with you about the uphill they, battle well, that where, Donald where Trump you faces. That from? Because the reality is, polling data doesn't support that position. If we if we were to go by your statistics, Roland, Donald Trump would not be in the White House. But the fact no, is, no, no, he no, is no, 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 no. I'm asking you. <laughs> you state no, no, not my not my statistics. Yours. You stated that they are losing that support. I'm saying where? Where's the data? Where's the proof? Well, first of all, let's look at the elected officials within the Democratic Party. There is a rift between the progressive base and the establishment base. And when I'm talking That's about the establishment not. base... There's no rift. What's the, the rift? <laughs> the, the Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez of the Democratic Party versus the Nancy Pelosi establishment... Um, There's no rift. So what's there, the rift? There, if there wasn't a rift, then Nancy Pelosi wouldn't have to get her party in order behind closed doors. The Democratic what are you Party does about? not know what their well, okay, identity is. First of all, Demetrius, all they know leaders, that. all leaders meet behind closed doors. This is no different than, than Paul Ryan or John Boehner meeting with the Freedom Caucus, meeting with moderates and others. And so again, you're saying there's this this rift. They're not getting no. That's simply not true. Are there differences between? Congressman uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Democratic moderates as well. Nancy Pelosi's it, job as the speaker is to bring all of her party together to move legislation. Brother Demetrius, did you see? Here, did you see the? Uh, and, and the House Oversight Committee is becoming fast, becoming must-see TV. If you watched <laughs> AOC, if you watched the Representative Plaskett, if you watched um, Rashida Tlaib grill the clearly dementia-addled uh, Wilbur Ross today about adding this uh, this citizenship uh, question to the uh, census, what you know is, as Roland said, you may have ideological differences in a party, but what we are faced with now is a Republican Party that has gone wholesale in the direction of fascism. You're talking about voting against extending voting rights for folks with H.R. 1, with the first bill out of the Democratic Senate. Look, brother, you can look at the cover of today's Politico, where it talks about how Nancy Pelosi has been talking behind the scenes to AOC, to Ilhan Omar, to all these folks. And the range goes from Ayanna Presley all the way out to Lauren Underwood. And one thing is for sure, what they are not is the party of white supremacy. So you're going to have to do a little bit better than that, brother.
<laughs> also, too, if there was really a rift there between the progressives and uh, the, the sort of the left flank of the Democratic Party, then Nancy Pelosi would not be the speaker right now. She's actually managed everybody well, but each party has their, 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 their uh, flank that goes to the right and the, goes to the left. The rift, so, has been, the rift has been there since 2016. Well, when the DNC took the nomination away from Bernie what, Sanders. What substantively and, and practically is an example of that rift? Well, what practically is an example of that rift? I mean, Bernie Sanders lost. So if you're going to say that, well, Bernie Sanders came and did a few things, he lost. He lost to Hillary Clinton. So, okay. I mean, it was an interesting discussion, uh, but it hasn't stopped uh, them from uh, governing and winning. I, I'm just sure. trying to figure it, it, out what, what does Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton running in 2016 have to do with black women in 2020? <laughs> I'm talking. I'm talking about their base. I'm talking about the demographics that they need if they think they're going to defeat Donald Trump, which is right now an uphill battle. For I see. Donald Trump actually, lost actually, the popular actually, vote. Not, actually, again, right. again, it's By not three million a people, battle. Right. It's, first of all, it's not. It's not an uphill battle because when you look at uh, the latest polling data. Uh, the numbers are clear. The and popular that is vote doesn't determine who the occupant of the no, vote No, 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 no. Did let's you, be, did let's you, be real clear. Yeah. Uh, no, first of all, we John, are fully John aware. Kerry won the popular vote in 2000. Yeah, well, that, did, did, you, did, you, did you see the senators who, who uh, on the GOP who voted against their president in the, in, in, in the, uh, the security measure? Did you see that? Go look at those I senators who voted. Absolutely. No, that's your roadmap to Trump's defeat in right, 2020. that is. That really is. That's hugely right, well, well, problematic. Well, again, let, 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 let me be real clear. Uh, first of all, let me be, oh, one second. I'm, one second. Not, I'm not a spokesperson hold on, one for second. Donald Trump. I didn't vote <laughs> for Donald That's Trump. Good. Trump. <laughs> right. this, everybody this. hold on. I'm going to let you make your final <laughs> point. I'm sticking with 2020. And what I'm right. saying, Demetrius, Demetrius, I'm going to let you make your point. Hold on one second. I'm letting you know right now, this is very simple. When you talk about 2020, you say it's an uphill battle to defeat Donald Trump actually not true. Donald Trump has some fundamental issues right now when it comes to independence. He has some fundamental issues when it comes to white women. He's also even getting lower scores among his core base, and that is non-college white voters. And so I would say your party, he's got some work to do if he wants to be able to uh, go uh, to come back uh, for a second term. Demetrius, your final comment before I go to my next story. I, I, I agree with the points that you're making, but I'm saying that these points were also echoed in 2016 when we saw that the base, the demographics that Trump was struggling with, that Hillary Clinton would make up for that, she did not. So with Trump's flaws, and there are many, the Democrat base still has to find their identity, and as of right now, it's an uphill battle. Well, I'll tell you what, i tell you what, if you look at, you keep going back to 2016, the public has now seen how Donald Trump has operated as president, and a lot of those people are regretful of their vote for Donald Trump. All right, folks, let's talk about uh, Beto O'Rourke uh, officially announced that he is running for president. Uh, of course, he uh, made the, made, told a, a local station last night uh, in El Paso that he was jumping into the race. He unveiled uh, a three-and-a-half-minute video today. He's raised a ton of money from small donors. Uh, of course, when he when he ran for, uh, against Senator uh, Ted Cruz, raising some $80 million again. So he released his video announcement. Here's part of that announcement he dropped on to, uh, social media. We can listen to and lift up rural America. We can work on real justice reform and confront the hard truths of slavery and segregation and suppression in these United States of America. Over the coming days, I'm going to travel this country and listen to those who I seek to serve to understand from your perspective how we can best meet these challenges. So here's a question that 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 is that needs to be actually asked and also answered. National media has spent tons of time talking about Beto O'Rourke running for president. Huge cover story uh, that dropped this week in Vanity Fair uh, of uh, Beto O'Rourke uh, in jeans on a roll with a dog in the photo sitting next to a <laughs> truck uh, in Texas. But he lost by three points to uh, Ted Cruz, who was hated by not only Democrats, but lots of Republicans hated Ted Cruz. But the interesting thing is that Andrew Gillum, who ran for governor of Florida, and Stacey Abram, who, who ran for governor of Georgia, who both lost, they actually lost by less than 1%. So the question is, where's the media hype and the party enthusiasm 
for those two. Greg, I'll start with you. Very quickly, I think Beto O'Rourke, for all his youth and all his charisma, is about 10 years late. Uh, he's white Obama. If this were 2007, 2008, he'd be the one to mug, uh, he'd probably be the one to mug Hillary Clinton on the way to the nomination. But the field is too crowded now. The Democrats are not going to put two white men on the ticket. He's probably auditioning for the vice president role, and they're not going to be able to do that. Now, he is a wild card. I mean, after all, his mother is the stepdaughter of former Secretary of the Navy under John Kennedy, and his pops was a Democrat his whole life until he switched to the Republican Party to try to continue to win elections. He's been all over the map ideologically, although he votes generally center-left, mostly more left than center. But I think I don't see how uh, O'Rourke is going to move forward. Finally, I would say this. Uh, two people who should be governor were it not for voter, for, voter uh, theft in G Florida and Georgia, uh, Andrew Gillum and Stacey Abrams, probably should buy their time right now. As far as I'm concerned, the rising star in the Democratic Party, if you talk about electoral po politics, is probably Stacey Abrams. And Stacey Abrams has all the cards, and she just needs to figure out what she wants to do next. And Andrew Gillum or Stacey Abrams one day may be sitting in the White House, but I think uh, timing just is not going to work out for, uh, for, for Mr. Uh, O'Rourke. Lauren, if they talk about Beto O'Rourke raising 80 million bucks and how he is so charismatic, but even when you look at that Vanity Fair article, when you look at these other pieces, he's offering no real reason why he wants to run for president. Uh, Nancy Pelosi was asked a question about uh, major legislation uh, that he passed as a member of Congress. Nobody could come up with that. Uh, and so the question is, why Beto? Uh, because donors and media love him, and there's always a media darling. You know, John Edwards was a media darling, and uh, Barack Obama was a media darling. So was John McCain. If you're somebody that is well liked by the press and you speak well <laughs> and move your hands a lot, darling? then you uh, you get this sort of Vanity Fair treatment. If I was Andrew Gillum and Stacey Abrams, I'd announce tomorrow. Because really, if this could happen, then like anything is sort of possible, right? I mean, a guy that loses to Ted Cruz, albeit in a very southern state, but then again, Georgia and Florida, no picnic, and Stacey got much closer than Beto did to winning. So my thing is, I mean, if we're going to do media darling, we're going to do this by media darling, then either of, either of them could actually announce. I mean... The other thing about Beto O'Rourke, though, too, is that and I don't know how he's going to get by Kamala Harris. Because if you do charisma and you do substance, you're going to come up with Kamala Harris or Cory Booker a lot quicker than you come up with him. And frankly, Kamala Harris was an AG and a U.S. senator, and he was a House member. So I don't know how you, if you do by experience and substance, issue by issue, on the debate stage, I don't know how he's going to out-talk some of the other people on that stage. Demetrius, you were laughing, but the reality is Senator John McCain was a media darling. That whole Maverick deal, how even his own people, I mean, you can you can talk to any of them, how he would come back and he would talk to the press, he would right. always be with them. And so, yes, <laughs> and if you don't think John McCain was a media darling, who spent I, more it, time on Sunday morning shows than Senator John McCain? <laughs> so, yeah, John, John, Senator John McCain he, was a media darling when he, when he ran for president. Yes. <laughs> Uh, being accessible to the media and being a media darling is two separate things. I will argue that Senator no, he was wasn't really a media. He was not really a media darling until okay. he started opposing Donald Trump. Got what? it. I would I would I would echo the, the comments what? of Greg in terms of Beto O'Rourke. Now, here's the reason why I think he'll probably probably be one of the few last candidates standing. He's likable. He has vigor. He has charisma. Now, he does lack lack the policy chops. He does, as you had mentioned, aforementioned, he does lack legislative victories. But I'm not quite sure, given previous election cycles, if that's really going to matter. The, the one person that I that I think is probably a little miffed at him is Senator Bernie Sanders, because I think that Sanders base and O'Rourke's appeal are going to be to the same demographic. And I think people in, within that demographic would venture to the younger O'Rourke. But I think it's going to be an uphill battle for him. I think he's auditioning for VP. Uh, Greg, here's one of the things that jumps out, and this is very simple, okay? Prior to running against Ted Cruz, I had no idea who the hell Beto O'Rourke was. <laughs> I'm a native Texan, okay? I mean, native Texan, born and raised. Um, there were any number of members of the Texas delegation 
uh, if you talk about Bill Flores as a Republican, if you talk about that crazy nut Louis Gomer, uh, if you talk about any number of people, I'm, I'm being dead serious. Prior to running against Ted Cruz, I had never seen or heard about Beto O'Rourke. I can't recall a single congressional hearing. I can't recall a single news conference. I can't recall a single television appearance. And so I get people are hyped about him coming close to beating Ted Cruz uh, in, uh, in 2018. Uh, but I keep telling people, running for United States senator is totally different than when you're running for president of the United States. Sure, but and we know the Democratic Party has uh, a, as much of a gangster mentality as any other large political enterprise. They're not going to let Beto O'Rourke uh, win. He would have to win outright to get that nomination. But of course, uh, you know, you, he came to prominence in that, uh, what, 16, 1800 mile uh, road trip he took and, and streamed live on Facebook with Will Hurd, who was arguably black Republican, of course, from Texas, better known than him. You know, Beto O'Rourke, and I know you're going to cover this story a little bit later about the, uh, the college admission stuff. Beto O'Rourke is a great example of whiteness. He is a guy who kicked around, went to Columbia, and graduated with a degree in English, came back home, worked in the family business, and then started his own business in technology, uh, kicked around, worked on some political campaigns, beat a Latino in a 80% Hispanic uh, district out there in West Texas, in El Paso, and then decided to uh, go and, and, and leave his congressional seat after several terms and say, I'm going to run for Senate. Look, man, it don't get no more real in terms of white privilege, white male privilege than Beto O'Rourke. And what right, we have folks. to face is the fact that the American electorate is very rarely, if ever, focusing on policy. And the reason, Roland, you hadn't heard real of him quick. is because he hadn't done anything. Um, right. He hasn't done anything. In the, <laughs> he hasn't done anything in the House. Obviously, he served all of his time in the House in the minority. But, you know, you had that criticism a little bit of Barack Obama in terms of substance. But Barack Obama, the senator, had actually done a few things and stood up on a few issues like immigration. Uh, but but we'll see if charisma and just talking a lot on social media can pull it off. We'll see that because yep. Beto, Roth, Beto O'Rourke is going to be that candidate. All right, folks, let's talk about some news out of Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, stunning news. Southern Poverty Law Center, they have fired the co-founder, Morris Dees, citing misconduct. They won't say what the misconduct was. Dees co-founded the center in 1971. They sued the KKK, and the uh, office uh, was firebombed. Uh, it is a very influential uh, law center there. They, of course, also track hate groups all across the country. Uh, they also have raised a ton of money, some $450 million. Now, uh, it, but Dees has not been with our controversy. He previously uh, was criticized by black employees uh, for his treatment of them at the Southern, Southern Poverty Law Center. Others have accused him of being more concerned about raising money then about fighting on behalf of minorities and others. And so we're going to continue to watch this story to see uh, exactly uh, what comes about. But Morris Dees, co-founder of the Southern Poverty Law Center, a major, major uh, center there when it comes to covering issues of race and hate groups in America, fired today. He's 82 years old. So we'll see exactly the reasons why. Let's talk about, of course, uh, Donald Trump. And uh, folks, check this out. He gave an interview to Breitbart News that caught our attention. This is what he said, quote, I have the support of the police, support of the military, the support of the bikers for Trump. I have the tough people, but they don't play it tough until they go to a certain point, and then it would be very bad, very bad. Okay, this is the president of the United States, the guy who has said in rallies that he would, he would uh, pay for folks, uh, of course, who would beat up other people. He's essentially saying that if it's time for a fight, the police and the military, they're going to be on my side. Demetrius, what the hell was that? <laughs> Listen, Roland, if you, think I'm, if you think I came on your show to speak in defense of Trump, no, um, I'm asking, no, no, you might no, have Demetrius, <laughs> Demetrius, I'm not asking you to defend. I'm asking you, what the hell was that? I, I don't know. I, it's typical Trump lingo, <clears throat> Trump speak that's been going on since um, he descended down those elevators in June 2015. Uh, listen, I've long had issue uh, with the president's rhetoric, um, putting um, certain Americans against other um uh, Americans. Um, I disagree with the notion that that's who he is. I think if you're going to occupy the Oval Office, you should have impeccable character and you should have the ability 
um, to speak in a discreet and professional way. And I think that he's lacked that um, ever since he's occupied the Oval Office. Uh, Lauren, this is a guy who is essentially um, uh, saying that, oh, yeah, uh, all the folks with guns and they're backing me, including the thugs. Donald Trump <clears throat> is, is who he is, and this is who he is. I mean, the idea that there's some other person that's going to unmask itself like an alien taking off a mask. This is the guy that we know. He is his words. He can't run from them. This is the reason why his... Uh, you know, his approval ratings are, are, are in the tank, and it's the reason why he's going to be a one-term president. Greg? You know, Roland, it's funny. I go back to the night that you had election <clears throat> coverage, the night that Trump won the presidency, and I think about the fact that that's probably the day that this country changed forever. I give him credit for this. He's dropped all pretenses now. His re-election strategy is basically white supremacy. And so this country has a decision it's going to have to make over the next couple of years. Is it going to go into a space where it's going to fracture and be irrevocable? It cannot be put back together? Or is it going to confront this challenge of fascism and white nationalist supremacy and in beating it back, perhaps by itself a little bit more time to work out the experiment? But he's dropped all pretenses now. He's, he's just going to go for broke. All right, folks, let's talk about this crazy story out of Florida. A black woman and her daughter are walking on the street in South Miami-Dade, Florida, when a man called a, one of them a whore and then threatened them with a shotgun. So she called the police. And then this happened to 26-year-old Dima Loving. Just calm down. You know what? She needs to be corrected, okay. if anything. Calm down. All right? Why? Why do I have to be corrected when my life was just threatened and my daughter's sick? I just want to go Are you going to keep this right to my No, please stop. She didn't even do nothing. Do not touch me. Do not touch me. What the heck? I am. What the? Why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? Do not touch me. She's not doing nothing. I wanted to call my kids. I just said I wanted to call my kids. My phone is dead. What do you not understand? I got a gun pointed in front of me, and my kids are sick. I'm stressed out. I need to go call my children. D. Ramos? I need to call my kids. What's his name? I don't understand. D. Ramos? Ramos? Ramos, officer, what's your name, please? I'm asking you. We're busy right now. We're busy right now. Who can I talk to right now, please? Can you touch me? Can you help me up? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Really? Does anybody have a cage? Really? really? Well, who can I speak to? Adri, get my hair. Adri, getting my Move. hair in my purse. Can you give me a second? Move. Can I grab her purse, please? Why does he have to handle her like that? She didn't do anything wrong. Yeah, the one he's giving her orders and saying that he's being but disorderly, at the, she needs to calm down. But she and, wasn't being disorderly, saying. though. She wasn't being disorderly. I had the video. No, it's just him thinking he could use his authority to do what he wants to do, and that's not cool. And this shit is going to get dealt with. Like, y'all not going to keep abusing your authority like that. Okay, let's be clear. A gun was pointed at Dima Loving. She shocked and stunned. Cops arrive, tell her to calm down, and then take her down. Miami-Dade Police Director Juan Perez immediately suspended one of the officers who is yet to be named. Demetrius, you're there uh, in Florida. Uh, we always talk about crazy stories that happen. It's always Florida. Uh, but this is an example that black people have to deal with. Here is a black woman who calls the cops for help, for help, and then she's the one who's handcuffed and put into a squad car. In this particular incident, we, um, we see video proof of, of what happened in this particular uh, encounter. And I would say from what I have saw that uh, there was unnecessary aggression used by that police officer. There should definitely be an internal investigation, an internal review of this particular officer, why he did what he did. And I think he should be dealt with appropriately.
Greg, we consistently see white women yell, cuss, act a fool, and the cops are calm and they listen to them. But it was as if zero to 60, boom, we're about to take you down, put the cuffs on you, because she wouldn't calm down. The rules of engagement of non-whites are clear. And the rule of engagement of black people are clear by the police. Treat us like animals. <clears throat> see, the, the sad thing about this for police forces all over this country is as follows, and history shows us this. There's gonna come a time when the police roll up, somebody's gonna blow one of their brains out. There's gonna come a time when people, as you heard the young lady say at the end, y'all gonna stop abusing your authority. And that time will come when it's clear that law enforcement cannot police itself, when the criminal justice system or the judiciary, and we just saw another judge confirmed today on the Fourth Circuit, uh, replacing, uh, on DC Circuit, replacing Brett Kavanaugh, Trump just got him through, got her through. It's going to come a time when people decide to take the law in their own hands because the law has failed them. This, we're getting too close to this now, Roland. Every show, it seems, you've got a video like that. And at some point, somebody's going to decide that they would rather be judged by six than carried by four cops. And that's just going to uh, judge by 12 rather than carried by four cops. And that's just the reality. History, American history shows us that. Dima Loving talked, Lauren, to the Miami New Times and this is, this is what they, their lead. Dima Loving and her friend Adriana Green had just left home in South Miami-Dade when a neighbor began shouting insults at them. Loving, who is 26 years old and Green, age 22, said they planned to run errands when Green's 50-year-old neighbor called the women whores. Loving and Green say they ignored the insult at first, but then when the abuse continued, Green threw a plant into the yard of the neighbor identified in police reports as Frank Tum. That's when Loving says Tum, who is white, pulled out a shotgun and said he would shoot my burnt black ass face off my neck. They fear for their lives, called 911, and went to a safe place. Five cops showed up. And then Officer Alejandro Garaldo pulled up, quote, he started interrogating us like we were the suspects. I asked if he could escort us back to my friend's house so I could put my phone on a charger and call my children. I had just had my life threatened and was terrified. He was so rude and aggressive from the get-go. He kept telling me I needed to calm down, but I was so scared at the moment. She then says that he, you, you can hear him saying the woman needs to be Baker acted. Baker acted. Apparently, that is a mental hospital uh, there in Florida, Lauren. Well, I mean, let's see what happens next. My prediction would be that all the cops involved in this will be suspended with pay and will be cited in some way, probably not something harsh, but, you know, it's so ridiculous and outrageous. This is a particularly ridiculous uh, example because they, of course, uh, actually, are not the suspects. Uh, let me interrupt you, Lauren. <laughs> yes? Police reports show that after stopping to arrest Loving, Officers did not detain the neighbor, Tom, <laughs> who pulled a gun on the women. Yeah, so... Because he's one of them. <laughs> yeah. Basically, it's, obviously, this is a, you know, a pretty incredible example of stereotyping by members of the law enforcement community in Florida. And uh, it, it really is a strong example of what happens when you stereotype people for, effectively, nothing. But I'll, I'll be very surprised if the cop, particularly the, the guy that got physical with her right away, doesn't get punished in a, in a fairly severe way. It will depend on how long he's been on the force and how long that particular police union, uh, how strong that particular police union <clears throat> is, but that's the type of thing that one can lose their job over uh, because it's so outrageously stupid. Well, and the point that I keep saying over and over and over again, uh, that officers are supposed to be de-escalating. Right. Most times when we see when it comes to black people, they are escalating a situation. And so we'll certainly be following this story to see uh, what happens next. All right, folks, the United States has the highest rate of death in childbirth birth mm. of any first world country. Mm. Around 700 mothers a year die in childbirth. Black women fare even worse. Black women die in childbirth at three to four times the rate of white women and they suffer complications at twice the rate of white mothers. Here to break this down is Brianna Lipscomb, the U.S. Maternal Health and Human Rights Campaign Manager at the Center for Reproductive Rights. Um, when, uh, Brianna, when you look at this story, I mean, we're talking about, when we talk about um, gaps, we talk about 
inequality, when we talk about what is happening, uh, whether it's wealth, whether it's education. Uh, a few years ago, Jeffrey Canada, the Harlem Children's Zone founder, uh, was a, was with Marion Wright Edelman, the Children's Defense Fund, and they were releasing the a report on the state of black children in America. And one of the things that Jeffrey said is that if we want to deal with the inequalities in America, we literally have to go back to the womb. He said, he said that black children in the womb of the mother, when they come out of the womb, they are already behind white children. This confirms that and lays that to be to be true. Yeah, that's very true. It's a, it's a very true statement. Thank you for having me on the show to even talk about this. Um, and I would challenge that to say that even before the baby is in the womb, it starts with that mom and how she's been treated across her lifespan, because it's it's that prolonged exposure to um, to stress due to exposure to racism, which is why it makes it um, challenging for healthy outcomes for both mom and baby. Um, so we, we have a lot of work to do in the U.S. because um, we're, we're focused on some of the wrong things when it comes to trying to improve our health outcomes for moms and baby. We're not addressing the issues of, of racism that we should be. And this also is one of those stories that you, you are never going to hear uh, in a presidential debate or a town hall. People have this whole view that, oh, we have the absolute best health care system in the world, bar none. Yet when you begin to talk about stories like this, it reveals the fundamental problem we have in this America, in this country, no different than these rich white parents uh, trying to bribe their way uh, into school, that in America, it comes down to money and resources. That's exactly right. The good thing I will say, though, is that with the increased exposure that this issue has received in the press, we have seen an unprecedented number of politicians focused on this issue. And in fact, um, Senator Kamala Harris, um, who is now a presidential candidate, has put this on um, kind of her platform of things that she talks about quite a bit. Um, she has introduced legislation in this past Congress um, around addressing maternal mortality. Others, like Senator Cory Booker, and and, and there's a lot of others that are now trying to come out on this issue. And what we what we challenge our members of Congress to do is to make sure that we don't lose sight of the racial disparity. Um, in fact, the bill that passed this past December um, was great to help us with quality improvement initiatives in hospitals. We need that. But it was missing the piece about how we close the disparity gap. And when you have black women dying three to four times the rate of white women, I think it's clear that we have to address the issue among black women first if we really want to see change. And many of the bills are missing that. Uh, this week, Donald Trump released his budget. Uh, what is the impact of his budget uh, on this issue in these women? That's a great question. Um, I have not looked at the budget in detail. What I do know is that um, the current administration um, has constantly put uh, sexual and reproductive health care services and access to those services under attack. Um, we're constantly fighting um, efforts to prevent certain providers from providing family planning services and other um, reproductive health care services. And it makes no sense to me when we're in a situation where um, women already have um, diminished access to health care providers and to health care services, why would we then go in and say, just because this particular provider provides these types of um, reproductive health care services, then they are not eligible to receive funding to provide other services? We have to get well, away from that. Uh, Brianna, just pulled this up. So uh, Trump is uh, calling for a 21 percent cut to the, part, to the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, and we're talking about, uh, of course, uh, uh, that, that quality of care dealing with uh, a number of folks. So for instance, uh, the budget would propose a $451 million cut to training programs for health professionals. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, and also uh, massive, massive cuts uh, to uh, Medicare, uh, Medicare as well. Yeah, that's problematic. I think any time that we 
this is the thing. The U.S. is already one of the leading spenders when it comes to health care, um, really any nation in the world, yet we have the worst outcomes. Um, so <laughs> it, we, we have a lot of work to do because then if we, we already spend more than anyone else, but now we want to decrease the services. We're not providing preventive care services. We're waiting until people get sick, right? Um, and so I think that instead of cutting health care and training that our providers need, what we need to figure out is, you know, what type of services would help our women, specifically black women, get to where we need so that we can stop dying when we just simply want to have a baby. I think the other thing, since you mentioned um, the training of providers, is that we have to think about the diversification of our, our medical workforce. When it comes to physicians and nurses, black people are severely underrepresented in those fields. And then when it comes to the, the people that are actually in the education, um, providing the education to those providers were even more underrepresented. So if we don't have black people training our providers on how to care for black people, how can we ever expect our, um, our medical workforce to provide um, care that's free of discrimination and bias? That is a major concern we should have. Um, questions there from uh, Lauren, Greg, and Demetrius. Lauren first. Um, you know what? I don't have any questions because she was good. <laughs> and I've seen Brent. these stats before. It's just yeah. amazing situation. Sister Liskum, we talk about these, the, the gap. And I was reading the USA Today report. 50,000 women who may have survived but still were injured. Let me ask you just a very direct question. You know, how do we close the gap in a country where it's so clear that black life is not only undervalued, it's not valued at all? I mean, how do we address the cultural issue? That's a great question, and I think it goes back to making sure that we um, talk to providers head on about the situation. I, like I said, a lot of the funding that has come out to address maternal mortality has focused primarily on quality improvement initiatives in hospitals, and we do need that. But until we start talking to providers about why a black woman comes in and says repeatedly, just like Shalon Irving did, just like Kira Johnson did, just like Serena Williams had to, yes. Yeah. Um, yes. advocate for herself and say, that something is wrong and this is the problem and for whatever reason their providers don't listen to them and and sadly many of the women are ended up dying or having severe maternal complications until we figure out why that has is happening and how we can fix that we are not going to close this gap and so i think we have we have to have an honest conversation about race and racism and discrimination and bias and how that's uh, manifesting in the care that's delivered to women that's resulting in women not not being able to raise or live to raise their own children. Thank you. Demetrius, do you have a question? Uh, yes. In, in talking in terms of uh, black women, um, the access that they may have to <clears throat> quality health care, health care centers, hospitals, how, what do you think steps need, what steps do you think need to be taken to make sure that we can build more of those and have it in areas where they live instead of them having to go miles and miles away from their homes to the nearest hospital? That's a great question. I mean, we're seeing unprecedented rural hospital closings. Um, I'm, in the, I'm located in the South, so um, we're seeing a lot of rural hospitals that are closing simply because they just can't financially afford to keep their doors open. Um, and so, we do have to figure that out. I know there's been a lot of talks around telemedicine and the role that that can play. Um, I think a couple of things. One is we also have to allow women to make choices about where they want to deliver. So historically, we've had traditional midwives that have provided care to all women, not just black women. Uh, midwives back during slavery and, and since then have been delivering babies for white women too. Yet somehow we have medicalized childbirth and no longer really give women an option of where whether they want to deliver in a hospital or not, and in many areas have criminalized traditional midwifery. And so, mm -hmm. one, if we can go back to allowing women to have a choice about how they and where they would like to deliver, I think that that can help. The other piece that we can't lose sight of is that although we do see a lot of deaths in rural areas, we are still seeing a lot in urban areas as well, where women do have access to clinics and things like that. So the question is, if I have geographic 
accessibility to um, health care services, then why am I not going? What are the other structural barriers that exist? And then what is the care and the treatment that I'm receiving if I do go to that clinic? Um, so these are just other barriers that we have to talk about. And we're not going to get those answers unless we center the voices and the lived experiences of Black women. So we have to have Black women at the table when we're making um, these policy decisions and having these discussions. All right. um, Roland, Brandon, can I say one, we're, one we're, thing? Brandon, let's go. We certainly appreciate the amount of time. Brandon, I certainly appreciate it. Thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you. All right, folks, going to a break. We'll be back on Roller Martin Unfiltered. Just a moment. Hey, fam, we'll check out Roller Martin Unfiltered, the blackest show on all of digital cable and broadcast. We'll check out our audio podcast. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roller Martin Unfiltered. Press play. I love myself when I am laughing. Writer and folklorist Zora Neale Hurston. All right, folks, our HBCU Giving Day University is Morris College, founded in 1908. Located in Sumter, South Carolina, notable graduates include David Weeks, Laura Hall, Arthenia Bates, uh, Milliken, Leon Wynn, and Margaret Ross Rogers. If you want to support Morris College, go to morris.edu. That's morris.edu. All right, folks, calling all HBCU alumni, students, and leaders. Enter the Ford Motor Company HBCU Mobility Challenge and win 25000 bucks for your school. Building on their long-term support for, of HBCUs, Ford is looking to improve mobility in HBCU communities through innovative solutions. Now, the winning program will receive a grant of up to $25,000 to implement their proposal. The deadline to apply is March 31st, 2019. Go to fgb.life, that's fgb.life, for more information and to apply. Ford goes further in our community. We certainly appreciate them being uh, a partner here at Roller Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, some quick updates on some stories we've been covering. Empire star Justice Smollett appeared in court today in Chicago to enter a formal plea of not guilty to 16 counts of disorderly conduct related to charges he faked a possible hate crime against himself. His lawyer entered the plea as Smollett stood by silently. And so, of course, uh, he was also he, with a number of his family members uh, when he showed up in court. Uh, let's go to Los Angeles, where I am, in the case of a Trinity Love Jones, a young girl found in a duffel bag a couple of weeks ago. Trinity's, Trinity's mother's boyfriend, 38-year-old Emil Hunt, has been charged and arrested on one count of first-degree murder. Trinity's mother, uh, Tequista Graham, was also detained as a person of interest in the case and is being held on $2 million bail. Graham is a registered sex offender, and Hunt was previously convicted of child abuse in 2005. He is currently being held on $2 million bail. If found guilty, Hunt could face a possible maximum sentence of 50 years to life in prison. And folks, last night I saw this tweet from the governor of Mississippi, Republican Phil Bryant. This is what he tweeted yesterday. Thank you to, to Donald Trump for signing legislation today to designate Medgar and Murley Evers' home as a national monument. Senator Wicker and Senator Hyde Smith have worked very hard on this for some time and are to be commended. Okay. Why is this offensive? Some of you might say, hey, What's the big deal? It's a great thing designating the home of Murley and Megger Evers as a national monument. The problem is the three of them didn't have a damn thing to do with this. Congressman Benny Thompson, the only African-American congressman from Mississippi, has spent 16 years, 16 years fighting to make this a national monument. And then Phil Bryant wants to be such an ass that he congratulates only Republicans? It was not Senator Wicker or Senator Hyde Smith who led this. In fact, if you check the numbers, the three people who he mentioned, Donald Trump, Wicker, and Hyde Smith, were not even in office 
when Congressman Benny Thompson started to work on this initiative. This is a Republican governor trying to somehow completely erase what a black man had been working on for nearly two decades. And then Bryant tried to get indignant when he was asked about it by saying, why is Benny Thompson uh, trying uh, to get credit for this? Well, maybe because he was the one who made it happen, Governor Phil Bryant. Demetrius, I want to go to you. W look, what the hell's wrong with your party in Mississippi when here's this black member of Congress who worked his tail off to make this happen, and the governor of Mississippi doesn't even have the decency to credit the man who spent 16 years to make this come to pass? Well, the simple solution is to credit everyone who's involved. Like you said, this was something that's been going on. Did you say for 16 years? I believe that's the number no. of years. Congressman Benny Thompson introduced <laughs> this in the Congress 16 years ago. Sure. Wicker wasn't even in the Senate. Hyde Smith wasn't in the Senate. Donald Trump wasn't even president. Sure, absolutely. My question is, well, what took so long? What was the, what well, was the hold all, up in, 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 the, in the process six, 16 years ago? I'm actually like, why Why are we waiting 16 years for this to finally come into fruition? Oh, I, I understand that, but I want to deal with that Phil Bryant got even, he even got indignant towards Benny Thompson, essentially saying, uh, what is wrong with you demanding credit? Well, I, I echo your concerns. Credit everyone is involved. The senator, excuse me, the congressman from Mississippi, the people who signed it into law, and give make sure that everyone is accredited the praise that they deserve uh, when it comes to this important um, occasion. Um, Greg and Lauren, real quick, I'm, I'm going to actually play a video. I was in Mississippi, uh, Jackson, Mississippi, in November for the Mike Espy runoff, and I actually went by the house and we shot some video there. Uh, but, but, uh, but, but, Lauren, uh, Phil Bryant is being a complete ass. <laughs> yes, yes, he is. I mean, one of the one of the more un, you know not so talked about subtle forms of racism is trying to erase somebody and trying to pretend that somebody doesn't exist and their work doesn't exist. And Benny Thompson is, is really one of these people in Congress who gets a lot done with very little press attention. Mm -hmm. And this is extremely, as you pointed out, extremely intentional mm -hmm. on the part of the governor. Mm -hmm. Greg? Yeah, and, and another, another must-see viewing is Benny Thompson chairing at Homeland Security uh, Committee here right. in D.C. He's really moving ahead. You know, I respect Governor Bryant. I respect him as a white supremacist. Uh, his behavior, he's not acting like an ass. He's acting like the Klansman he is. He shares a surname with Carolyn Bryant, who still walks the earth, who's the reason Emmett Till got put in the ground. Let's be very clear about this. Not just Benny Thompson, but if you look at social media, a lot of black elected officials in Mississippi who have been pushing this years. Every time I fly into Mega Evers uh, Airport in Jackson, Mississippi, we go over to pay our respects over at Mega and Merle Evers' house. Let's be very clear. Phil Bryant's a white supremacist. And you don't compromise white supremacists. You don't, com you don't have conversations with them. You break their political back. That, that state is 40% non-white. It's time to break their backs. Yeah, I agree with that. Folks, again, uh, again, when I was there in Mississippi in November, uh, I dropped by uh, the home uh, where Merle and Megger Evers lived. And here is a tour uh, of that home. 332 Margaret Walker Alexander Drive here in Jackson, Mississippi. And behind me is the home, uh, the home that was of Mer Merle Evers and Megger Evers. Now, of course, he was the NAACP's field secretary uh, and Army veteran, of course, who was working uh, to get voting rights and other civil rights on behalf of African Americans. And so, uh, as you see here, this is a part of the Mississippi Freedom Trail. Uh, and so you see the sign here. Uh, that exists that lays out in terms of uh, the home here and of course he was assassinated June 12, 1963 and this, this was placed during the 50th anniversary of the Freedom Rides uh, which took place in 2011. Now if you come onto this side over here of the sign what you will see is uh, an explanation uh, that this was a three bedroom home and it was the first uh, middle class subdivision built by black develop developers uh, here in Jackson so there's lots of information here 
uh, about, of course, uh, this neighborhood, the home, but also uh, Megger Evers and who he was. And, of course, uh, he a um, uh, uh, major leader. I mean, he was a huge leader here uh, in Mississippi uh, who gave his life on behalf of uh, civil rights. And so uh, what took place, folks, we're going to walk this way. And so what took place on the night uh, President John F. Kennedy was given a speech about the importance of a civil rights bill. Um, what happened was Megger Everest was coming home. His family was inside uh, watching the speech. Um, and then, of course, uh, across the street, uh, there's a take a shot there, take a shot across the street. Across the street, hiding behind the cross, but in those wooded area there, was a uh, white supremacist Byron Della Beckwith. And so when Megger Everest uh, came home, uh, he pulled into the driveway here. Uh, and then uh, his car pulled in, and he went to the back of his car to get uh, some items out of his car, some T-shirts and signs, and that's when the shots rang out uh, that killed Megger Evers. Of course, he was hit. Then, he, of course, he crawled his way uh, up this driveway right here uh, to the steps where his uh, wife and uh, his children came out. And, of course, it was horrible for them to actually see their husband and father uh, shot and killed. And what you see here, of course, you, he you see here, uh, th this, of course, is a National Historic Landmark. Uh, and so you see uh, the sign right here uh, that says that uh, the bullet passed through Megger's body and crashed through the lower left pane of the living room window. So the bullet went through his body and hit the window. Uh, and, of course, uh, and it has all the details here. Uh, these photos were taken by the Jackson Police Department shortly after uh, his murder. Uh, and you see an aerial shot as well. Uh, what uh, where uh, took place and so um, and it says here that uh, the aerial view shows the Everest home at the very top of the photograph it depicts where assassin Byron Della Beckwith's car was seen earlier by witnesses at Joe's drive-in uh, and of course uh, in spot number two uh, indicates Beckwith's hiding place from which uh, he fired the shot that killed uh, Megger Evers and so uh, of course uh, as I said it's a national historic landmark and you see some of the other photos that are up here as well uh, that marks. And so the image over here, this was the car uh, that Megger Evers was driving, the white car. And then, of course, he was shot. And then again, after he was shot, he crawled, made his way, uh, crawled uh, under the carport uh, to uh, his family there. Why is this important? Uh, because uh, Megger Evers was an American hero. Megger Evers was a brother who gave his life for civil rights. Here we are in Mississippi, uh, 2018. He was assassinated June 12, 1963. And it was his death that was one of the sparks that led to the 1964 Civil Rights Act and, of course, the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And uh, this is a man who, again, gave his life, he was fighting on behalf of other black folks. He gave his, he served his country, served in the military, bled, came home, but could not enjoy those same freedoms. And so here we are in 2018, U.S. Senate race, African-American Mike e Espy is running for the United States Senate. Uh, the election will take place on November 27th. And for a lot of people out there, uh, they say, well, I don't really see why it matters. The reality is it matters because we're standing on hallow ground. We're standing on the very place where Megger Evers died in order for people to have the right to vote. Now, you might not say that doesn't mean anything. But the reality is the wife, and the children lost their father in order for us to have the right to vote. And so, folks, the reason Roland Martin Unfiltered matters is because unlike Governor Phil Bryan, we know who gets the credit, and that goes to Congressman Benny Thompson. Uh, we wanted to get him on the show, but he has some conflicts today, but we certainly will have him on the show on some other issues again. He spent 16 years making that possible for the home of Met Grant Murley Evers to become a national monument. So congratulations to uh, uh, Congressman Benny Thompson, and forget the haters uh, like Governor Phil Bryan of Mississippi. All right, folks, uh, Demetrius, great.
Greg and Lauren. Thanks a bunch for being on our panel today. Uh, to all the folks, you, uh, don't forget, uh, we'll be broadcasting tomorrow. So here's the deal. At 6 p.m. Eastern tomorrow, we will have my one-on-one -on -one interview uh, with actress Erica Ash. Uh, of course, many of you know her from, from Survivor's Remorse uh, and many other shows and movies as well. Uh, she is going to, including Uncle Drew. Uh, she, so we're going to have our one-on-one -on -one interview. And so that's going to air at 6 p.m. Eastern. At 9 p.m. Eastern, we're going to broadcast from Los Angeles, the site of the XQ America live event. They are all about uh, reimagining education in America. And so our 9 p.m. show tomorrow is going to be all about education, uh, talking about uh, how we reimagine education. How do we close uh, these, these gaps when it comes to these reading gaps and these math gaps uh, that exist? How can we uh, get kids more excited about education? So that's going to be tomorrow. So we're going to have, again, the one-on-one -on -one interview with Erica Ash at 6 p.m. Eastern. And then we're going to, of course, we're going to go live at 9 p.m. Eastern right here from Los Angeles. Ava DuVernay, uh, Naomi Campbell are going to be joining us uh, tomorrow, so you do not want to miss the show. Uh, and look, the reason this show matters is because we talk about the stuff that other people are going to ignore. Uh, I guarantee you, you're not going to see uh, anyone going on the home of Medgar Evers on MSNBC or, uh, C or CNN or Fox News or those networks. And so we want you also to support Roland Martin Unfiltered by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com and joining our Brain the Funk fan club. Every dollar you contribute, whether it's five bucks, 10 bucks, 50, 100, or even more, goes to support this show and the work that we do. Uh, we are about telling our story. We are about empowering ourselves, enlightening of our folks, entertaining our folks. Uh, but again, giving you information you're not going to get any where else and so that's why it's important for you to join our fan club of course we have uh we we run every friday all the names of our fan club members and beginning next week uh we're gonna have some uh some products and so our fan club members are gonna get uh, a percentage off of products that we're gonna have on our website i'll tell you more about that next week and so if you are looking for uh discounts uh to any number of things and i'm gonna share with you next week what they are you can only get that if you are part of the Brain the Funk fan club. So go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com to become a part of the Brain the Funk fan club. We've got some great things lined up for you this weekend. We told you today about the Black Women's Roundtable. We live streamed their news conference today. But we're going to be live streaming uh, from uh, that conference on Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. And so we got, uh, and that's why this show matters because we are about covering our people and controlling our narrative. All right, folks, from Los Angeles, I hope you have a great, great evening. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Holla! You want to check out Roland Martin Unfiltered? YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roland Martin Unfiltered. See that name right there? Roland Martin Unfiltered. Like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And don't forget to turn on your notifications so when we go live, you'll know it. Hey fam, want to check out Roller Martin Unfiltered, the blackest show on all of digital cable and broadcast. Want to check out our audio podcast. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roller Martin Unfiltered. Press play. Martin. You want to support Roller Martin Unfiltered?
shirt, be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roland Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com.